Hi, I'm Mike Swinney. First of all, I want to thank Paul Brodsky for uh, asking me to do this. Because I don't, I can't, we are talking this morning, I don't think I've been asked to speak in front of a group of people um, this large since I employed about this many people at Sony Corporation and had to speak to them on a regular basis. And I don't do public speaking very often, so it's very uncomfortable for me. But as you go through your careers, you're going to find the greatest rewards come from doing things that are way out of your box and probably make you way more uncomfortable than you want to be. Um, I sort of wanted to start by thanking my mentors and so forth, but we'd be here for a really long time unless I limited it to my mom and dad. Um, mom taught me a great love of music and art and architecture and style and so forth, and dad taught me how to make money. Um, he was the, my mom used to, in fact, I can remember one story where mom said, um, so you want us to move from Austin, Texas to San Marcos when I was six. And 1956, he was the first route salesman that the Frito Company, I'm sure you guys all know what Fritos are, um, hired as a sales guy. She said, so you're going to go try to sell to a largely Hispanic community fried corn in packages. It's something that they make every day as a staple of their existence. And he said, yeah, but this will give them a lot more time to do other things and be with their family and so forth. And to a certain extent, she was right. To a greater extent, he was way more right because um, it allowed him to retire at a very young age and go do what he wanted to do, which was fish and tell me how to do business. Um, there it is. I think it was Marissa or Brett who said, you should really talk about international experience because that's kind of what you guys want to hear about. My career has been primarily oriented around entertainment, the entertainment industry, in many cases where it intersects with real estate, which doesn't sound like it should, but it does. Um, so I've done a lot of projects that were either as small as building and owning movie theaters, bars, restaurants, nightclubs, lounges, things like that, all the way up to much bigger entertainment complexes and theme parks um, and developing those for other, for other people and other companies. For the first probably 25 years of my career, I spent uh, most of it in sort of four companies, one that I owned with five or six other partners, um, one working for George Lucas trying to figure out how to finish the development of Skywalker Ranch and uh, put him into other real estate development projects around the, around the country only to go in one day and say, you really shouldn't be doing this, you really should be making movies and not concentrating on this. And then with Sony Corporation for about 10 years, I was the CEO of their location-based entertainment company that built Metreon in San Francisco, a whole load of Sony-style stores around uh, the country, one of which we'll talk about later, and then a project in Berlin and a project in Tokyo, so that started me loving to travel a lot. And then in 2000, um, I started a company called Hyper Entertainment as a consulting business to people who were trying to develop real estate projects that were entertainment oriented in various parts of the world. And um, my girlfriend, now, should I say third wife? Third wife. Um, and I decided we would try something different and move to London, move the company with us, and lived there for almost 10 years. And in that 10 years, we had some 25 clients that hired us to do various projects. 35 projects in total over that 10 year period in 22 different countries. So there's a lot of corporate mileage built up with British Airways and so forth. Um, I am going to keep saying um. Almost none of those projects relied at all on US based uh, intellectual properties films, TV, things like that. So we got to work a lot with 
new stories, new storytelling, and we'll come to stories a little later, but um, it's uh, fascinating to see in various cultures around the world how much they are the same, and yet how differently you have to tell them in order for people to understand. So what are some of the things that you need to know about uh, doing business internationally? Well, first of all, it doesn't really matter where you're born. If you've gone to school in the States, it's gonna be assumed in most countries that you've gotten a good high quality education. If you've gone to Glendale College, you've automatically gotten a good quality education. Um, what they're really looking for in hiring you and hiring you out of the system of this kind of university and universities in the US is an attitude that is much more, oops, about that. American attitude is very different than a lot of attitudes around the world. Volumes have been written on how an American can do attitude. Sometimes um, uh, it almost sometimes gets us in too much trouble but there are many countries and cultures, education systems, traditions, that don't have room for a persistent sort of desire to accomplish great goals. And that's what a lot of international companies are looking for um, when, they, when they come to hire you. Let me give you one example of one of our experiences. We were asked by Sony to create um, an attraction museum in Berlin. They picked the subject, it was music. They said we wanna, this, isn't, this was 1997. So they picked music, it's a good time for music. Um, they said they wanted a lot of international visitors to come to this location. They had the location on the border of what used to be East and West Berlin, um, not populated by any significant residential population not visited by anybody in the world, including most Germans who wouldn't go there. Um, and then they wanted it done for children. And for the 20 years prior to us taking on the project, Berlin experienced negative growth rate in their population. So no kids, expensive site, hard to get to, no visitors. What are you gonna do? So we went back to Sony, told them, how much it was gonna cost, why nobody was gonna go, and they basically said, we still wanna pay you to go do this, come up with a great idea, and we have other reasons for this. So, I went and made a deal with Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Yoko Ono, um, and Ringo through Apple Corps to take the Yellow Submarine at music the art of Peter Max, and turn it into a moving theater, so to speak, where you actually got to drive and ride in the yellow submarine on an adventure that took about five minutes, 10 minutes, something like that, as the lead attraction for what was called the music box in Berlin. It was now the anchor attraction, along with an IMAX theater, to Sony's new European headquarters building which drove traffic of about a thousand people a day into it to work. But now people could say, have you been to the new Sony thing? Have you done this? Have you done this? All over Berlin, all over central Germany. And for about five years, kids from all over the world would show up because one of the other little things that we did was film the Berlin Philharmonic doing five different pieces of classical music. We worked with Stanford University and MIT on a device that projected from above, encircled the person. They could listen to the music. They could see the pictures on the screen. And every time they moved the baton, it played. If you moved it faster, it played faster. If you moved it slower, it played slower. If you moved your hand up, it got louder. If you moved your hand down, it got quieter. But kids got to experience what it's like to conduct and own an orchestra. There were about a half a million visits a year to the site for five years. When Sony decided to close it, they called me and said, 
we know we spent too much money. We don't really care. What we really appreciated was that no matter what we said, no matter what the challenge was going to be, we appreciated that you and your team said, don't worry, we can do this. We understand what your reputation needs are, and we can make it a success for you. It was no, by no means a financial success, but a cultural success, a company success of the top order. Second point I want to make. Oh, good. <clears throat> you should know about working in it internationally. The second point is you should be prepared to restrict beyond what you think might be reasonable. Wherever you go, whatever culture you go into, you need to spend a, a whole lot of time with your senses understanding, touching, tasting, smelling, hearing, seeing, everything that goes on around you. Absorb as much as you can. And as people throw challenges to you, take a second. Don't react. Don't respond. Absorb. And don't respond until you have an opportunity to really think through culturally what they're asking you. Um, couple of examples. Some of this is going to be, you know, also notice that talking is not one of the senses. Um, we were asked by uh, a rather large Abu Dhabi investment group who were about to spend three quarters of a billion dollars to build a theme park if we would actually work with their construction and design guys, but also with Ferrari to try to translate between an American design team who they'd hired to design the theme park, a Middle Eastern company who was there to execute and try to figure out how to market this to the world, and an Italian car manufacturer who was happy to cash the enormous check that they were willing to pay them for the rights to do this. I will never forget taking the theme park guys and the builders into Marinello, Italy, driving cars around the track to get accustomed to what does a Ferrari really do, which is one of the great thrills in my career, um, and then presenting to them how this attraction was going to work and what it was going to do and how you could be thrilled by having a Ferrari. So one of the great attractions, the, the seminal attraction in the theme park was going to be the world's fastest, most dangerous um, roller coaster. It would go up, it would go around, it would whirl around, it would turn upside down, it would go over here, it would do this, it would do that. It would go straight line speed like you wouldn't believe. And we thought the Italians would just absolutely love that. And the first thing they said was, you can't build that. We won't allow our name to be associated with that. Why? Isn't that what Ferrari's all about? They said Ferrari is about speed and elegance and luxury and a lot of things, but it's not about turning one of our cars upside down. <laughs> if you do that, somebody dies in our car. We don't want to encourage anyone to ever attempt to do that in one of our cars, and we don't want you to portray us like that. So back to the drawing boards. When it opened in, uh, was it 2008? I don't remember, 2008, 2009. Um, it has the world's fastest roller coaster. It looks kind of like that picture there. It goes in a straight line speed of about 170 miles an hour. And it does a big bank, and it comes all the way back at 170 miles an hour, and then it makes another turn and it stops. It was great. It's the way a Ferrari would do. It also missed culturally one huge, huge problem. If you're a woman and you're out with a guy, chances are you're not dressed in Western wear, you're dressed in a burqa. At 170 miles an hour, the burqa is back there somewhere. <laughs> and it's really damned culturally um, 
wrong. So operationally, what had to happen? They shut down the theme park for men at various times. They shut down this ride for men at various times. And, and they slow it down for women and children to ride. Or you wait until women who are dressed in Western wear, which is acceptable in Abu Dhabi, um, can ride with men. Otherwise, you can't. So nobody, and we weren't in the middle of all of those meetings, so nobody on either side was listening to what the other people were having to say, and they certainly weren't absorbing the culture and really understanding how people were going to use some of the things that they were being asked to use. <clears throat> we were also asked by um, Majid al Futaim company in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to come and help them define for King Abdullah and one of his committees how entertainment could happen in the future, in the future of Saudi Arabia. And they said, what we'd really like for you to do is execute market research and focus groups in Jeddah, uh, Dammam, and Riyadh. Uh, oh man, you mean we have to put people in a room and explain entertainment to them and get reactions from them? And we'd spent a lot of time working in the Middle East. And I said, okay, well, we're only going to take two people from the company, and I'm going to be one of them. And I took a woman who works for me as the other one. She could be in the room when we interviewed men and children. I couldn't be in the room when we interviewed women. It was against the culture. And I'm happy to not be in the room. But we got unbelievably interesting results, really incredible results from asking people what they wanted. And at the end of the day, they didn't care about theme parks. They didn't care about nightclubs. They didn't care about um, big museum-y type events. What they really wanted were movie theaters. It's one of the hardest things to do, though, is go back and say, just build movie theaters and everything will be OK. Because again, culturally, we couldn't say that because we knew what it was going to take to actually get a film played in the country. It would have to be edited for content. It would have to be edited for language. It would have to be changed so that people didn't, couldn't sit like this together. Um, men would have to sit on one side of an aisle. Women would have to sit on the other. The lights couldn't be any more dim than about what we're sitting in right now. Otherwise, it would be culturally incorrect. So we took that back, and about a month after we delivered the report, we got a note from uh, the King's um, assembly group saying how much they loved the work that we had done, appreciated how we had completed it on time, on, on a correct budget, et cetera, and loved the result of it. And if we ever decide to execute the plan the way you guys described it, we'll call you. 2009. Haven't heard from them again. But I will say, they are building movie theaters. They have built movie theaters. They operate them very differently than we operate here. But it, but it works. And culturally, I think we were able to help them figure out how to make those kinds of things work. My third point about working internationally is this. So you've proven that you have a can-do attitude. You've restricted and absorbed as much as one human possibly can about projects, the culture, the people, and so forth. Uh, then I'd say one other thing, and that's don't be intimidated. Don't hesitate to tell the truth. They don't want to be sold. They do want to be sold. They don't want to be sold something that isn't absolutely what's on your mind and absolutely unintimidated and unafraid. That's all part of that can-do bit. And they want to believe that you have paid attention and that you know more than they know about what they should be doing. So 
Let me give you a couple of examples. Let me stop my phone from making noises. Um, here's one. It, Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Does everybody know what the Globe Theater is? Does anybody know what the Globe, other than Charlie? The Globe Theater was built uh, in the East End, south of the Thames River. What years were the first one? 1400s, 1500s, somewhere in there, 1600s, whenever Shakespeare was alive, 1600s. Um, it was redone several hundred years later as a theater. It's an unusual theater in that uh, I think they do now allow women actors, which they didn't do back in Shakespeare's time. It's all stand-up. There's no seating except way up in the rafters of the thing, and that's only because there are so many Americans that go and don't like to stand up through an entire you know, two-and-a-half-hour play. But they also built a giant exhibition of what life was like, what kind of costumes people wore, or how did the theater work, and so forth. And for the longest time, it did really good business. And then they hired a company to help them fix little things about it. And they fixed the little things, and they redid parts of the, the theater experience, and their sales of tickets went through the floor. None. Selling no tickets. So their advisor hired us as a second advisory to come take a look at the thing. And I, I said, you know, I don't want to work on this. Somebody else in the company can work on it, um, which Someday you'll be able to do that. When you own a company long enough, you can say, I don't want to work on that. Um, so my wife and a couple of other people went to work on it and fell in love with the project. It's a great project. The exhibition is fantastic, incredible. Maybe if we market like this, maybe if we do this, maybe if we do this, you can get more tickets. So we worked on it for about six months, and ticket sales didn't get any better. And they come back to me and go, Maybe you can help us figure this out. You know, what? Okay, maybe. Tell you what, I'll go look at the theater and see if I can figure out what the problem is. And I went and I sat on that brick wall for about two hours and just watched people interact with the building. Went back and said to my wife, so how does a person buy a ticket to the exhibition? Well, they go through the door, they go through the front door, and the ticket seller for the theater sells exhibition tickets. Really? How do they know that? Well, because there's big signs and big pictures, and they're really pretty, and everything on the outside of the building. <coughs> all, excuse me. All about the exhibition. I said, yeah, but how do they know to go buy a ticket? Well, there's a door. I said, yeah, the door is there. The door is always closed, by the way. And it says theater entrance. So think about that for a minute. If you're a visitor and you don't really know a whole lot about the globe, but you go there and you see that it's got something really cool inside, and it says it's an exhibition, and all it says is theater entrance, where are you going to go? Most people go to the pub next door. <laughs> and wait for somebody who's been to the exhibition to come out and say, oh, you have to go through the theater entrance. So what do we do? We put up a new sign that said, theater and exhibition entrance. And what happened? They quadrupled the sales of their tickets without doing anything else, without making any changes to the exhibition, just by saying, you know what? We've missed completely what the point of this was and what we needed to be saying to the audience. We were paid, we, we won, we, we and a Canadian company, Canadian design company, won a competition to try to convince Chinichita Studios. I don't know, anybody here know who Chinichita is? There's no filmmakers in the audience. Chinichita Studios in Rome is um, maybe the most well-known studio outside of, you know, next to maybe one in England. 
it's the one of the biggest studios in in Europe, and it's been there for a hundred years, and been making all the Fellini movies, all the you know, great Italian European films. Uh, they bought Dino De Laurenti's studio a few years ago, and said we want to build a theme park. We proposed that they build a theme park that was all about the movies that had been produced there, and they said. Well, we don't own any of the films. And I said, yeah, it's okay. You can license the rights. I'm sure people would, you know, gladly pay, would gladly take some payment uh, since most of their movies are long since decayed. Um, they said, okay, well, you, you're a competitor. Make that pitch. So we did. Put together a very big pitch document, told them how it would operate, told them how to sell tickets, what we thought their P&L would look like, um, and so forth. And then we lost the competition. And we lost the competition because the competitors said, you know what people visiting Rome really want to do is they want to see Rome, even if it's a recreated Rome. So they pitched redoing the Trevi Fountain, redoing the Spanish Steps, redoing the Colosseum, redoing experiences in Rome that for the most part you could go do in the real place except that they wanted it to be, you know, lions killing Christians and things like that happening. So we lost the competition. They won the competition. I think this thing opened this summer. I'm not sure. I haven't kept up. But it's a theme park now that's all about the movies that were made at Chinichita Studios and not about a fake rope. Because when they did the market research, which we intuitively, from listening to our client and understanding the culture and being absorbed in it, understood that that ultimately was where they were going to end up. And I'm okay that we lost it. I'm not bitter at all with the company whose name I can't remember from Canada who beat us. Um, so there. My final point has two parts. First of all, everything I've told you about working in international markets, you should use in this market. No matter what you learn and how you learn it, no matter where your home country is, if you restrict, if you absorb the culture, if you listen more than you talk, um, and if you're willing to take a lot of risk at being uh, attitudinally more about doing things and less about following things, you can have a uh, great career. And one of the things that we learned, probably more difficult to learn, was it's all about those four letters. It's the story, stupid. It's all about what you tell. It's all, it, it'll help you raise money, it'll help you create a better life for yourself, all of those things. Let me give you one example. This is not an international example, this is a New York example. I was asked if while I was at Sony to go fix a store that Sony had designed and built through their electronics company at their U.S. headquarters building at 55th and Madison Avenue, what was the old AT&T building. And when I got there, what I discovered was a 3,000-foot store over here in this part of the building and across an open breezeway in Manhattan, in New York, in the dead of winter, was another 5,000 square foot store over here that was trying to be one store. So we had physical issues to deal with. But more importantly, we had the Sony Gallery, as it was called, it had these issues of preciousness. And that that was a key attribute of the Sony brand, was that it was precious. I've never heard that before. Nobody that I knew thought that a 20-inch television set was precious, but everything in the store was in a glass box. 
You couldn't get to it, you couldn't touch it, you couldn't play with it, you couldn't listen to it, you couldn't, you could watch it, but you had to watch whatever it was they wanted you to watch. So I said, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take on this challenge. It was making about $5 million a year in sales, which is pretty good for an electronics store of about 10,000 square feet, you know, 500 bucks a foot, not bad. In midtown Manhattan, where there's, I don't know, 12, 13 million people living there, should do better, couldn't discount, because then we would be competing with people who bought things at, uh, you know, lower rates to sell. Uh, so what did I do? I hired a fashion designer because I said, you know, there are more single women living in Manhattan than there are single or married men who will buy stuff if you teach them how to buy stuff, if you let them buy it the way they'd like to buy it. And so we put together this little team of people, and I wasn't getting it. I just wasn't understanding exactly how the design was going to come together, exactly how it was going to work. And I remembered one of my old mentors saying, it's the story, stupid. And I said, okay, I'm going to go get a storyteller. So I went and hired Ray Bradbury. I don't know if any of you know who Ray Bradbury was. Wrote the Martian Chronicles, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Illustrated Man. Was considered one of the great futurists and uh, science fiction writers ever in America. And he and I were friends for a long time. And I said, Ray, you know, can I hire you for a day? Yeah, that'd be fun. I'd love to come work on a on a physical project, that'd be great. I haven't done that since Walt asked me. But, okay, so there's Mike Swinney and some guy named Walt. Okay, great. I like that company. Um, paid him a lot of money, flew in first class from LA to New York, put him in a suite at the Sherry Netherland Hotel, picked up his $300 bar tab, yeah, one guy, one night. I can't begin to I can't begin to explain it, unless it said Louis the Thirteenth on it. I didn't understand. Anyway, he shows up the next day. It's freezing cold. He's got his hat and coat and everything. We spend the whole first part of the morning getting to know each other with the design team and so forth. And it's like presentation, 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 and so forth. And it gets to be about three o'clock in the afternoon, and Ray stands up. You know, where are you going, man? You know, the bathroom's down the hallway. No, you, you guys have got it. I, you don't need me anymore. No, we don't have anything, right? You haven't said anything all day. What do you, come on. He said, no, you have it, trust me. Put on his coat, put on his hat, walked over to this big board, big white board, and in as big a letters as he could wrote S-O-N-Y. I've just spent 15 grand on this guy, and he wants to tell me who I work for. And he looks at me, and he looks at the team and says, you don't get it? You still don't get it? He put a dot after the N and a dot after the Y and said, Sony, so New York. With that attitude and that story, we designed a store that is still there today. This was 1995. It went from selling $5 million a year to selling $20 million a year. And it's been doing that for 20 years. I used to think that uh, miracles were just coincidences that happened. There's nothing coincidental about that. But that was miraculous. You know, if you work hard, you think out of the box, you listen, you share as much of yourself as you possibly can, it should work. It doesn't always work. I'll tell you that. But I'll tell you this, when it does, 
It's magic. Thanks. I think this, this is where I say I'm happy to answer questions. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Happy to answer questions. If we still got time. You're going to have to either stand up or yell at me if you want to ask something. Nope. Mike. Yes. So what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? What excites you about work? Well, I work for me. I started a company. This is going to sound ridiculous. I have a degree in film production from the University of Texas. That doesn't sound ridiculous, unless you've been to USC. Um, it's a much better school, Texas. Uh, about 2011-ish, I'm looking at Charlie because he's my business partner, uh, I shut down pretty much all of Hyper's consultancy work and said, you know what, I'm 61 years old. I'm going to go start a film company. I'm going to start a production company. I'm going to develop films, develop TV shows, which is what we're doing now. Um, I was told by a very dear friend that we, sh we should move back to L.A., which we've done. Um, and what gets me going is I love creative projects. I like working for myself. I love that every morning I can look in the mirror and say, you need to go make more money. Or you did a really crappy job yesterday. You're fired. Um, you know, it's uh, what, what gets me going. It's seeing where the world's going and trying to be part of it. You know, I love being in the film business right now because it is chaos. And where there's chaos, there's a lot of money to be made. Yes? That's a great question. He said, uh, yeah, can, you, can I describe... Um, I want to say my reaction, but I, I won't. I'll describe what it's like in a major project to give up control of something that up until that point you had control of. Um, you know what? In 1986, 87, somewhere in there. I had had 10 years of owning a movie theater chain in Austin, Texas. We were the 40th largest movie theater company in the United States. We were the third largest in Austin. So we only had about 25% of all the screens in the city, but we had 80% of the business. And the reason we had 80% of the business is because I learned at a very young age that you can't do everything you can only give what you can give, and you can surround yourself with the smartest, the best, the brightest, and just don't be intimidated by it. Don't worry, because as they look great, you look like a hero and smarter beyond all belief. So giving up control in projects, um, I yearn for the day that I get to give things up I, you know, in, the, in the film business. Uh, I have a hard time with investors at times who say, you're going to be producing this. We want you watching our money every day of the week. And I usually have to say to them, I love the creative process. I love going out and raising money and dealing with the business side of it. From the time a director and a writer take over and start casting, it's like watching paint dry for me. I'm happy to turn that all over to somebody else. Happy to turn it over to Charlie. He likes doing that stuff. I'm horrible. I go on a set and a guy moves a light 12 times in an hour and nothing else happens. I just lose control over things like that. So, you know, giving, giving, I hope I'm answering your question, but giving up control is something you're always going to have to do. I've been married three times. Let me tell you about giving up control. <laughs> yes. You 
to start your own business? What's my advice to you? Start it. <laughs> Jump in, both feet. Don't be afraid. Um, take, take the hint that I give you based on the name of my company. My company is called Absolute Certainty Incorporated. If you don't have that, don't go into business. Just trust yourself. Yes. The marketing aspect that you gave earlier um, you broke it down quite simply. Could you please review it once more? Because right now at International Marketing Day, um, they have all these templates for you to follow, like over 12 pages to break down how to market to certain countries. And I find it mind-boggling all the steps that one has to take to do that. Can you simplify it? Are you really good at what you do? Are you really good at what you do? I am. You're the best marketing you could possibly be. It's, it, you know, for me, first of all, we started, when we started Hyper Entertainment, uh, it, took, it took us two years to get a website built because we didn't know what to tell anybody. But in 10 years, like I said, we had 25 clients, 35 projects, 22 countries. We never marketed ourselves at all. People knew who we were. They knew that we had certain expertise. They knew that if I put my name on the bottom of a piece of paper and said, this is what we believe, then people would fund that. Banks would take over. Have I always made money? Oh, hell no. But I've made more than I've lost. So um, There are things you need to know about every country. And, but the best way to know them is to go there Best way to best way to get to go there is to market yourself and your talent to somebody who wants you. If they want you, they're gonna you'll fit right in. What's one of your can can you name one experience that has sort of made you who you are today? Oh man. That's really hard. Um I learn from every experience I have. It, it, you know, some, sometimes I don't. I, that changed my life. My wife and I, my third wife and I, have a two and a half year old boy. I am inspired daily by him. So today, that's my inspiration. It was probably my dad. You know, was, I've kind of come full circle. In the first part of my career, I worked for my father. I'm not saying this is the end of my career, but now I work for my son. <laughs> so it's a good thing to be. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, biggest fears, biggest concern. Uh, you know, most people would say, am I going to be able to make any money? Am I going to run into roadblocks? You know, I, I have, <laughs> Paul's known me a long time. I've never really had any fear of starting anything. I have, I'm more afraid of finishing it, if anything. Because I don't know at the end, you know, am I going to be able to finish this and make more money doing something else? But I've gotten over that, too, for, for the most part. I just don't like things to end except for the first two wives. <laughs> How is so much cultural diversity going and ideas going to play out in, in the marketplace? I don't know. You know, when I started my career, my career started during the Vietnam War. Um, something would happen in Vietnam, and three days later it would be on CBS News. If something happens anywhere in the world, Right now, it's right now, you get to find out about it. Um, cultural diversity, um, in, in our experience, should be celebrated. Um, we never walk into a project and say, we know so much more because we're Americans. We do, we do walk into projects and say, if you can explain something to us, we can figure out how to make it work. So 
Or if we can't figure out how to make it work, you shouldn't do it. Um, but as far as we've been able to see the mix of cultures around the world and the number of people traveling today is staggering, people interacting with other people. It's like, you know, un unless you're on the fringes of society, you generally embrace each other for the differences. I, or, and I just can't imagine not embracing you for the differences. But I'm hoping there's more people like me than the opposite. Five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you have five minutes to get back to class. Oh, no, go ahead. I took a couple minutes at the end to worry as well. So maybe two or three. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you look at all these foreign countries. <laughs> Was language a big issue? Did you do? Did you take classes, or have someone who can interpret for you? And I guess learn the social norms. How did you did, develop the Did, yeah, did I did I take classes in any languages, and um, or did I have anybody help me figure things out? I always bought those little tour guide books before I went anywhere. Um, I can butcher almost any language there is. I've learned how to ask for where the bathroom is. I've learned about water and I, you know, my, my favorite one is walking up to the woman sweeping the street in Tokyo and saying, I can't find Shinagawa Station. And what happens? She understands Shinagawa. She didn't understand another word that I said, but she grabs me by the arm and walks me eight blocks to the station and then says, Orgato. And, Goes on because that's the culture. So your survival skill is to find someone and just leave you. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. It would, so far, it's worked. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, what what kind of movies, TV stuff are you producing? It, it's. Uh, uh, kind of all over the map, but uh, there are four television shows. One's a reality program. Um, there's a TV show that takes place uh, in Africa. There's a film that takes place in Africa. Um, they're, uh, for the most part, scripted TV, and they're more family and adult oriented, but not R ish rated. Or, yeah, yeah, there's one, mark my words, there will be a film called Lightspeed Dating coming out sometime in the next two years. Talk, talk to that guy right there, because he's, he's my business partner and agent, and uh, we, we read everything people send us. Everything. We don't, we, you know, we haven't gotten to be big enough or smart enough to say, please don't send unsolicited material. <laughs> and we can't move fast enough to steal anything from anybody, so we're not that well funded. Yes. Yes, you. Um, do I recommend starting a business with a partner? Can you do everything yourself? I, I love my partner, but I started my company on my own. I brought in a partner when I realized that there were so many things that somebody else could do better than I could do. It's all about giving up control of certain things. So if you run into the, if you start it and run into the obstacles that you have doubts about or you're just not very good at or whatever, go get, the, go get a partner. I hate working by myself too, by the way. No. Yes. Moving your companies around the world, how do you uh, keep from being liable or sued? Here to incorporate into another country, are you still protected the same? Do you think I haven't been sued? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I have great accountants and great lawyers, and I and I try not to ever break the law or even bend it very far, because 
when you're when you move around different parts of the world, you never know whose laws you're going to step on. I still pay taxes in the United Kingdom, though, whether I want to or not, and theirs are way higher than ours are. On average, forty-seven percent of your income. So, I think that's it. We're done. Thanks, Roy. There's a tie in here. Oh. Thank you. Michael, uh, I want to appreciate a great talk that you gave us, and we have a plaque to present you wow. to commemorate this occasion. Thank you so much. Thank you again for coming. That's very kind. Thanks.